probably the last place that any of us want to be. We're here in a cemetery because this is what we need to consider each day. It's one of the oldest mantras the church draws our attention to, memento mori, remember your death. In fact, as generals in the Roman Empire would come back and parade victoriously throughout the city, it was said that they would have a slave that would stand near them and whisper to them throughout the day, remember, you are just mortal. Remember, you will die. A reminder that what the world offers fades and fades quickly. But instead, what Christ offers is a word that is eternal, it is a word that is life-giving, it is a word that is himself that we receive in the sacraments, in the church, and in our lives. The world needs, needs desperately, people to step forth and proclaim the truth, goodness, and beauty of Christ. And we do so first and foremost by acknowledging that our life here is a pilgrimage. It is finite. It will end. And all of the great and grand things that we might do will fade away. And all of the things that we accrue, all the luxuries that we desire, will rust and corrode and turn into dust. Think back one generation in your own family. Think back two. Think back three. As we go back in the generations, our familiarity, our memory, and our capacity to even name those members of our own family begins to fade. Sure, we might be remembered, but not for long. Our souls, instead, are made for that which is infinite. And that is how we must order our lives and order our day, by living for Him. I remember when I was in seminary, it's many years of formation, preparation, planning. You have classwork, formation, apostolates, house jobs, friendships, difficulties, highs and lows. It's this whole journey, this whole experience. And when you finally approach ordination, one of the things that I remember really enjoying was sort of creating the ordination card. Now people refer to it as a holy card, which I think is a little presumptive. I call it a rookie card. But on it, you include an image, an image that's really important to you. And on the back, the date of your ordination, a request for prayers, and maybe a quote from scripture or a quote from someone or something that's very important to you. On the front, I chose one of my favorite images of the crucifixion, but on the back, I felt really compelled to include the Episcopal motto of a man who's referred to as the Lion of Munster, Cardinal Clemens von Gallen. He was the first bishop elected during the Nazi regime, during the time of Adolf Hitler. And it was then that he entered into this period in which he, frankly, upset everybody. That he would preach viciously, with great vigor, against the atrocities that occurred. And after the war, he would stand up and condemn the Allies and their treatment of the Germans. Now, in so many ways, he really wasn't liked by anyone, but he was a man who chose the path always of virtue and is now a blessed in our church for it. Now, the motto that he chose is as follows, nec laudibus, nec timore. May neither the praise of men nor fear of men distance me from God. I summarize just in those four words that his thought, his life, his action, none of it is dictated by his concern of what others might think or say or do. He was a man who was totally convicted in his relationship with the Lord. And in so many ways, that's what each one of us is called to in our own lives as Christians. But the world needs, in fact, it desperately needs the salt, the light, and the life and vigor that we offer as images of God in society. And increasingly, it seems like the darkness is just beginning to cave in and to cascade into our lives. We need to neither fear nor desire the praise that the world offers. We must simply exist for Christ. Neither praise nor fear. 
Growing up, it was always the same. Sunday morning, early morning, we'd get up, get ready. We'd stand there in our laundry room, our mud room. My dad would spritz our hair with water, comb it over, make sure we looked presentable for mass. And I remember thinking the world, still do, of my father. He's an attorney. He works hard, provides for his family. But I noticed something. He wears a suit every day when he go to work. He wears a suit on Sundays. He was one who feared nobody and lived only for his family. Continues to to this day. But we'd go and we'd go to church and I'd see this man who could do anything and he'd kneel down. And I remember looking at him and looking up at the Lord and looking at him and looking down at myself and sort of acknowledging something deep in my own heart. This is the one who could do anything, who could say anything. He was invincible to a young boy. And yet he kneels before something else, or really someone else, Christ. It's that witness that's so powerful to acknowledge our need for the Lord, that our hearts are hardwired, they are made for Him, that all of our desires are just faint echoes of the fulfillment that the Lord alone can offer. And to see Him kneeling there, not praying, but as a man of prayer, is a powerful image and an important step in my own journey. The world offers us much, but all of it is passing. We sit here in this cemetery and we remember that we are made for Him, and that our lives flash but in an instant. And we are pilgrims on a journey, and our hearts, our lives, they are made for communion with Him. It's in Him alone that we rest. So he sends us forth with this in mind, to hunt for souls, to seek them out, to draw them into communion, to walk with them as companions on a journey. Nothing that the world offers is enough, except the Lord alone. The sacrament of confession is where I have felt the Lord's love and I continue to, to this day. When we enter into that small confessional and we expose our sins to the Lord, we're vulnerable and we receive that love and mercy, we receive that absolution, it's such a moment of love and freedom. You know, when I go to confession, I really kind of break it down in my mind in four ways. My relationship with God, my relationship with my family, my relationship with my friends and society, and my relationship with myself. But truth be told, for those who go to confession, it becomes easier the more you go. You begin to learn those things in your life that you really struggle with that it's not just checking in like we would with the doctor every 10 years, but imagine going every two weeks and checking in with your sort of primary care physician. They begin to notice even small changes, these indiscriminate moments where you're like, oh wow, where's that from? Or how's that connected to this? And so when you think about confession, think about it in those four ways, your relationship with God, do you pray? It begins there first and foremost, when you get up in the morning, do you offer a morning offering? Do you pray to the Lord? Do you sit with scripture? Do you read the readings for the day? Do you sort of go through your agenda of the things that are being asked of you? And do you invite the Holy Spirit into that? Do you fulfill your Sunday obligation and obligations of every holy day? Do you encourage and invite your family into this as well? Do you speak well of the Lord? Do you take his name in vain? Do you take the things that he holds you to and calls you from in vain? or cheaply consider them. Our relationship with the Lord is really where everything begins. It's that solid rock of formation. And from that, we're able to move out into our family and into our friends, our coworkers, and the different things that are asked of us. And that's really where we get bogged down in the muck. Have I gossiped? Am I envious? Am I jealous? Have I judged? Have I used violence, physical violence, verbal violence? Have I struggled with anger or wrath? Have I been spiteful? Have I been lazy or slothful? 
have had lustful thoughts. Any of these things, really, you know, as we hear them, sort of draws out something. You say, I don't struggle with that. I do struggle with this. And in so many ways, we're called to really enter into that in a deep way. Because those sins, in so many ways, become like a check engine light. You're like, why am I such an angry person? Why do I struggle with anger and wrath so often and so much with so many people? Maybe the Lord's calling you to examine that just a little bit. Maybe there's a wound there that we've not allowed him to heal. Why am I so lazy when I finally have free time? Why am I so lazy? Why am I gluttonous? Why am I envious? We can sort of go through these different things and really ask ourselves, what are the sins that we're committing with great frequency? Are we honoring our parents? Are we lying often? Are we coveting things that are not our own? Have we stolen? Have we borne a false witness? And then to finally examine our, our own lives and our own relationship with ourself. Do we see the image of God in our own lives? Do we have dignity and respect for it? And do we bear that as the temples of the Holy Spirit that we are in society? Do we treat ourselves and our bodies well with the sleep we need, the food we need? Do we abuse ourselves in any way? Rejecting the dignity that God's called us to. Friends, confession is at the heart of spiritual growth. Spiritual life is really bound up in this intimate encounter with the Lord. We receive his mercy, but it's kind of the work and anticipation of that where we really begin to grow, where we look at our lives and we say, wow, I've really been living for myself in the past month. And so when you go to confession, there's a few things to consider. First, invite the Holy Spirit into it. You might be nervous. Maybe it's been a long time. Invite the Holy Spirit to be with you, to give you peace in that moment and to dedicate that time to the Lord. Give thanks to God for the moment. Go through your sins, first the mortal sins, first and foremost. This grave matter that you've freely chosen without any coercion, fully understanding how it is rebuking and rejecting the Lord and His will. Those mortal sins must be confessed. But even those other sins that really lead into that, into those grave moments in which we turn away from the Lord, can be offered back to him for his mercy and forgiveness. And so when we go, confess them. I might even recommend saying the words, I accuse myself of the following, because we find ourselves so tempted to say, I probably did this, I may have done that, I shouldn't have done this, perhaps, and we condition our own fault. Just be brave, be bold. The Lord is there to receive it all and to cast it aside. I accuse myself of the following, and we list our sins, we say how often we did it. We offer any details that might be necessary. We receive our penance. We offer our act of contrition and we go forth redeemed, loved, and set free by the Lord and his mercy. And so have no fear. It is the great stage of encounter with our Lord and Savior in the place of confession.